More condemnation of the proposed First Nations Education Act. Government inspectors look into a strange cargo dump on the waterfront. And Thunder Bay welcomes dozens of new Canadian citizens. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, Anishinaabe Aski Nation chiefs are doing whatever it takes to deliver a strong message to the federal government. Today, close to 100 people gathered on the Fort William First Nation to show their support for protecting First Nation education. As Courtney Rutherford reports, the rally is one of many events planned to make sure their voices are heard. We have a plan. We have a vision. NAN Deputy Grand Chief Goyce Kakagemic was joined by other First Nation leaders, elders, students and youth to call on the federal government. By hosting this rally, they are hoping that Canadians will join in the fight to protect their children's future by rejecting Canada's proposed First Nations Education Act. As you see, we have our ladies, we have our youth, we have our children. That's a grassroots movement to say to center the government. It's not only uh, uh, the, le uh, the leaders and the rhetoric opposing the bill, it's the people themselves uh, that are standing up today and I hope they listen today. After leaving the community centre, the protesters walked together to the Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada office. On November 7th, NAN chiefs during a special assembly confirmed and declared First Nations inherent and treaty right to control the future in the NAN territory. After three days of meetings by more than 200 delegates at a chief's summit on education, they now have full support moving forward with the federal government. Here, here's how we see the education system flowing. Here's how we see the education working. Here's how it better improves our kids, better improves our, our, you know, our part of the society. So, you know, it's work that we do and we can do it on our own. We don't need the government dictating to us who we are, what we are, and how we should be governed. The education template has been given to the federal government. However, NAN leaders have yet to hear any word on what's expected to happen next. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. Mayor Keith Hobbs says segregated youth centers in Thunder Bay are not going to happen. Hobbs says he's been receiving emails from people who believe there should be separate centers for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal youth. The mayor says the suggestions are coming from people concerned about the proposed move by the Indian Friendship Center into the Port Arthur Pras Vida. Hobbs calls the emails disappointing and racist. To me it had a bit of racist overtones and uh, I, I, don't, I don't really care for that uh, kind of discussion. Um, you know, this is going to be an all-inclusive youth centre and uh, we had a presentation from uh, two non-Aboriginal kids the other night uh, that are all in favour of this youth centre and uh, we talked about empowering our youth uh, in my inaugural speech and also at City Council in our strategic plan. So, um, you know, we got to get over this uh, racism issue in this city. Hobbs is supportive of the partnership for a youth centre at the PA Prosvita and says the majority of the public are too. A new youth centre received the highest support for new infrastructure in this year's citizen survey. The mayor feels there needs to be more education on what the proposed youth centre will be all about. Members of the North of Superior Travel Association are gathering in Thunder Bay for their 39th annual general meeting. It's a chance for tourism industry professionals to network and learn more about drawing visitors to the region. Every year, this group of NASTA representatives reports to the association about what's gone on over the past year in the area. And while it's no secret the weather did not encourage tourism in the region over the past summer, the president of NASTA says the industry is still going strong. Tim Luckenuck says while they don't have exact numbers yet, he believes it was a positive year for tourism in the Thunder Bay District. So what we're trying to do is focus on the tried and the true and the steady as she goes. Uh, for example, our Lake Superior Circle Tour Adventure Guide has been around for a long time, but it's still an effective program. It still works. A surprising number of people continue to want to see Lake Superior, to travel around the region, and that Lake Superior Circle Tour. The information brought to the table will help to decide which areas the Thunder Bay tourism sector can expand in next year. There are still a few details available on yesterday's mysterious dumping of a load of grain on the waterfront. Yesterday on the News Hour, we showed you pictures of the MV Saginaw dumping a large quantity of grain on the dock at Richardson Terminal. The grain had been loaded onto the ship from the elevator just the day before. Officials with Richardson have declined to comment on the situation. 
But now other sources on the waterfront tell us the emergency unload was the result of part of the cargo not being properly inspected before loading. And all the contents from two holds of the ship were dumped. Fresh grain from the elevator was then loaded aboard and the ship departed late afternoon yesterday. Unofficial estimates place the value of the affected grain in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The occurrence has drawn the interest of the Ministry of the Environment. MOE inspectors were on the scene today and they say while the grain poses no threat right now, it will have to be removed. The investigation into a string of camp break-ins near Thunder Bay is widening. Monday, the OPP reported several camps at Max Lake, located off Highway 527, about 90 kilometers from the city, had been broken into. Now they say other camps at the Courcy Lake, Marks Lake and on the Boreal Road have also been entered. All of the break-ins occurred between November 24th and November 30th with a wide variety of items being stolen. Anyone with information is being asked to contact Thunder Bay OPP. The debate at Queen's Park over controversial former Orange CEO Dr. Chris Mazik continues. In its latest attack on the issue, opposition progressive conservatives have accused the health minister of misleading the public on how much Mazza was paid. For her part, Deb Matthews says all documentation on Mazza's salary has been provided to a legislative committee investigating the case. Meanwhile, it remains uncertain whether Mazza will return to Thunder Bay's Regional Health Sciences Centre. The fur was created last month when it was disclosed that Mazza had been hired by the hospital as a locum for its emergency department. He spent one weekend on the job and, according to hospital officials, provided exemplary service. Today, hospital officials confirm they are continuing to explore options for future visits, but they add nothing has been scheduled at this time. The hospital has been scrambling to find qualified personnel following the departure of six ER physicians several months ago. The Ontario Addiction Treatment Centre in Thunder Bay's downtown South Core is on the move to a new location. The methadone clinic is currently located on East Victoria Avenue, but come January it will be moving to the White Cedar Healthcare Centre on Vickers Street. The new facility opened its doors in June and will now host the OATC as part of its strategic alliance. White Cedar officials say the partnership will further their mission to tackle the drug epidemic in Thunder Bay and region. Besides methadone, which is used to combat heroin and prescription drug addiction, the centre will also begin treating other addictions to substances such as cocaine, alcohol, and nicotine. The Lakehead Public School Board has reappointed its longtime chair and vice chair. Trustee Deb Massaro will serve her seventh consecutive term as chair of the board after being acclaimed at a meeting last night. Massaro says her goal is another year focused on student success. Also acclaimed was Vice Chair Karen Wilson, who will now serve her fifth term. A couple of major Thunder Bay fundraising campaigns are reporting some disappointing returns. Thunder Bay United Way officials say they brought in just over $1.3 million so far for this year's fundraising effort. And with just four weeks left in the campaign, that total is less than half of their $2.7 million target. Similarly, the Salvation Army says its Christmas kettle campaign has brought in just under $40,000, about $13,000 below the total raised by this time last year. It also leaves them well short of their $170,000 overall target. Both campaigns are urging people to make their donations today to help ensure that they reach their goals. Unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones, have become synonymous with the U.S. War on Terror and other military applications. But they've also become a billion-dollar business, and a local manufacturer believes he's created new technology to tap into that market. As Dennis Ward reports, Aerovate has already caught the eye of those who use and make drones on both sides of the border. This fun little gadget is nothing new and you've likely seen them around, but the propellers on it are special and could mean big business for a local aerospace operation. Aerovate have been working on what President Andrew Condor calls the automatic transmission for unmanned aerial vehicles. The propellers have passive pitch and can self-adjust without any input. Also referred to as drones, the UAV industry is expected to be worth $30 billion in the near future and uses for the technology continue to grow. By the Army, uh, both uh, uh, military and what we call high value civilian applications, uh, search and rescue for example, um, border patrol, that kind of stuff. So what this is going to be used for is basically giving those operators more efficiency when they fly. Aerovate is one of five Canadian companies who have been invited to the Canadian Embassy in Washington next month to show off their technology. 
Condor says the company hopes to catch the eye of contractors like Boeing, Lockheed Martin and NASA. Access to uh, these kinds of players is very important to us. Uh, you know, we want to bring them here to Northern Ontario. We want to uh, show them what we have to offer. And, uh, you know, we hope that that'll definitely be a, a way to uh, make that happen for us. All of the components for the propeller minus the blade are manufactured locally. If Aerovate is able to sign a contract, he says his business would need to grow very quickly. He believes the market for the propeller is huge and goes way beyond drones. We see it on small light sport aircraft, uh, on the airboat industry. Uh, we're open to licensing the technology, for example, for, for wind farms. Um, and uh, uh, fluid technology can operate and benefit from the same uh, type of design. So we're looking at perhaps outboard motor systems. Um, the beauty is really that it is adaptable to a very, very large variety of products out there. Don't expect to see any drones flying around the skies of Thunder Bay anytime soon. It takes three to six months to gain approval for a special fly operating certificate for just one day of action. Dennis Ward, TBT News. Canada is often referred to as the land of opportunity. 39 newcomers to our city had the opportunity today to officially become Canadian citizens. And everyone we spoke with calls today's ceremony important, meaningful and rewarding. Cheryl Holmes has more. Rawan Saliba has been dreaming of the day she would become a Canadian citizen. I've waited for this day for like seven years. I've, I've been waiting, I've been dreaming about this every day, every single day I wake up and I wish I was a Canadian citizen. And just today I'm so excited, I'm so happy. Just, I, I don't know, I don't even know how to express my feelings. Saliba was one of 39 people who received their citizenship during a ceremony at Confederation College. She came to Canada from Israel in 2006. Her parents wanted a better life for their children. Saliba originally moved to Toronto. She spent a few years in Ottawa and then settled in Thunder Bay this June. Canada is such a great country and being Canadian just makes me feel great. It makes me feel like I own the world. It's, it's a big dream for me. It's like, you know, it's something that I really wanted because it's a great country. It's peaceful. It's Everybody is equal. The equality is great, and I didn't experience that in the past, unfortunately. For many in attendance, this event was a long time coming. It brings feelings of reward and belonging to residents who spent much of their lives in other countries. I've lived in several countries, including U.S., in Europe, in Russia, Armenia, and Canada is one of the most welcoming places. It's probably the most, most welcoming place I've ever lived in, so that's why I chose to stay here. In attendance at the event was Thunder Bay Mayor Keith Hobbs, who himself immigrated to Canada 30 years ago from the UK. He said it's important to welcome new Canadians because immigrants have played a huge role in building our country and our city. I always like uh, to quote John F. Kennedy, uh, you know, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And that message was delivered to these people today, and uh, they're all excited about being uh, contributing to this city and to this country. Officiating the ceremony was a judge who's been through what most of these new citizens are going through now. I have gone through all those stages. I worked in the farm, I drove taxi, I went back to school. And then uh, I can relate myself, you know, for where they are uh, in their uh, story. And then encourage them and then empower them from that point onward with my own story, you know. Dhaliwal calls this a very important and meaningful day for everyone involved. He says it's rewarding and amazing to see others as they go through this process. Cheryl Holmes, TBT News. Eight different vendors helping eight different charities. That was the goal behind St. Ignatius High School's charity lunch market today. Kids in grade 9 computer classes teamed up with grade 11 marketing students to put on the event. The various groups are running a business for a day. Across the school auditorium, there were a variety of food choices, from McBurgers that sold out in five minutes to delicious cupcakes. Students divided into groups, researched a food business, started a concept, and now all the proceeds will go to charity. We just think it's really important that students take what they've learned in a class and be able to apply it to real life. So this is a, a business that they've built right from the inception and it's good for them to give back to the community. They picked the charity, um, they got to uh, pick the food, so they're really invested in the whole enterprise right from the beginning right till the end. We chose Count Quality. Since we are selling s'mores we thought it would fit good and we, uh, we really like what the charity does for the children here in Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario. 
Students learned how to work better as a team. They also were taught how to create a business plan and model. Blatto says these are key lessons in a workplace because employees always have to get along with others and get the job done.